Okay, so um, today I want to introduce kind of the last uh, friend of the Kalman filter, uh, the sparse extended information filter, which from the name you see it has something to do with the extended information filter, which we covered last week, but additionally it has the term sparse in there. And in the context of matrix, these sparse typically means that you have a lot of elements in this matrix which are zero, you only have a few elements which are one, a limited number of elements. And as you may imagine, if you have this big matrix and a lot of these elements are zero, just a few of these elements are non-zero, then certain operations can be done more efficiently. Because you all of values, if you multiply those matrix, turn out to be zero, you don't need to consider all elements. Therefore, whenever we have sparse matrices involved in some of the estimation problems we encounter, um, it typically allows us to speed up computations and do some nice tricks to, to do things more efficiently. And this is what the sparse extended information filter exactly does. And we look here into the variant for the slam problem. Um, and this is a result of kind of the sparsification of making the smart matrix sparse. A lot of the, the entries in our information matrix actually zero elements uses some approximations that are very specific to the SLAM problem. Basically that you have these kind of robot poles that observe landmarks, only the robot moves, and this correlates correlations between the landmarks and the robot's poles. And this is something which will be explicitly exploited here in this filter. Just this is a slide you may have seen or may remember from the um, extended information filter last week. So the most important thing is that we have um, two ways to represent the Gaussian distribution. One in the moment form, which uses covariance matrix and a mean vector, the one which is shown here um, on the left-hand side. And we have uh, a so-called canonical form, which is shown here, where everything is parameterized by the information matrix, which is the inverse of the covariance matrix, and the information vector down here. These are two equivalent representations. So you can express the Gaussian exactly in the same way in information form as well as in the moment form. And we introduced the extended information for the last week, where you can show that you obtain exactly the same results than the extended Kalman filter, with the extended information filter, in terms of estimating the quantities you want. Um, the main issue is that what is cheap in the Kalman filter is expensive in the information filter and the other way around. So for the Kalman filter, the update step is the easy part, and the measurement um, update so, sorry, the prediction step for the common filter is the efficient thing and the update step, the more, co uh, more costly one for the information filter, it's the other way around. And the problem is changing between those representation involves matrix inversion as a costly operation. So we cannot just change the representation between the prediction step and the update step and do everything fast because this conversation, uh, conversion is already as expensive as the most expensive operation individually of those two. Okay, so having that said, we have the common filter world and the information filter world, and they both provide the same results in terms of quality of the estimation. But the question is, is one or the other representation better suited to introduce approximations? And this is the case. And you can actually motivate that by um, this example over here. So what you're seeing here on the left-hand side are landmark positions and the estimates uh, provided by a mobile robot, which was driving along that trajectory here through the environment. What you see here in the middle is a normalized covariance matrix. That means the scale between, um, uh, between values between 0 and 1. So everything which is white is a 0, or some low value, and everything which is black is a value 1 or close to 1. And you can see here actually that all the x positions and all the y positions are perfectly correlated. And this matrix is kind of dense. So there are a lot of values which have um, non-zero elements. If you look, however, to the normalized information matrix, the corresponding one, so if I invert this matrix, I end up in this matrix. What you can see in this matrix is that there are actually only a few values which have, few entries which have large values, and all the others are, it looks as, as if they were zero. The important thing is they are not zero. They are very small values, but they are non-zero. So all these kind of small elements, which here on the slide may look completely white, are in reality not completely white, they're just close to zero. But by inverting this matrix, this leads to this completely dense covariance matrix. So the question one could pose in here is, could we actually work in this information form 
and do small changes to this matrix. Like, for example, setting all zeros, uh, all values which are very close to zero to zero, to make <coughs> small modifications as an approximation, and then obtain a matrix which is really sparse or has sparsity better. That means a little, large number of those elements are zero, and only a few elements are bigger than zero. And if this is the case, certain operations can be done much more efficiently. Like inverting the sparse matrix is much more efficient than other operations. And this is kind of the the key spirit which is exploited in this sparse extended information filter. There's where the word sparse comes from. Because we want to maintain this matrix here as a sparse matrix. Okay, let's have a look to this information matrix. What does the information matrix actually tell me? I can interpret the information matrix as representing a graph where the entries in this matrix actually represent um, Nodes in a gra um, connections between nodes in a graph. So every off diagonal element, which has a large value, let's say we truncate them and put the threshold to zero and once those values here. Every element which has one corresponds to a link between the corresponding edges. And everything which is zero means there's no link. If I don't have binary values zero and one, but I have values which uh, are between zero and one, you can see this as if they are all connected. And the bigger the number is, kind of the stronger that link is. You can see this link, interpret this link as the for the dependency between those variables, or a correlation in here, which turns out to be between those variables. So what you see here in this example is that all those um, um, elements here. So this every so the first three elements here are all the pose of the robot. So every element here which has a large value in this first three lines means that there's a link between the robot's pose, because these first three elements represent the robot's pose, and the corresponding node, or in this case, feature or landmark in the scene. Okay, so for all these things, these, these large values here, we have one of those links. So in this example, we have, for example, here, three links to, uh, from the robot to some of the features. And most other values are actually, or well, there are other values, and they are, but they are zero, or weak, weak values. What you see here is, is a structure where only those um, landmarks are connected with each, other, which, with each other, which are the local neighborhood. So showing this graph, although you see a lot of edges here, um, shows the fact that every landmark is only connected with a few landmarks in its surroundings. So there are only a few connections between those landmarks. That means if I know this landmark, it tells me something about all the neighboring landmarks. But if I know this landmark, it doesn't tell me something about the landmark which is far away. Because there's no, or at least not directly, if I don't know the others. Um, because there's no link between them. And so we can actually interpret this as a graph, and the more elements that are zero here in this matrix, the less links we have in the graph. And you can see the graph as um, indicating direct um, links or relations between the variables. This we will kind of exploit within this um, sparse extended information filter for the SLAM problem to um, approximate some of these values, set some of these values to say to zero, so ignore dependencies, but this way obtain the sparse information matrix, which then allows us to do a lot of computations very efficiently. It's kind of the key idea in the process here. So as I said before, the information matrix can be interpreted as a graph, or can be read the graph as links, and um, the individual elements, off diagonal elements of this information matrix can tell us how strong these links are between those variables. And um, what you typically observe is larger values, are, or the, other, the matrix has larger values that have features actually spatially close. So two features in the scene which are spatially close typically have higher values. And this results from the fact if the robot is at that position, and observes those two landmarks, we, need, we know something very accurately about the relative location between those features. This is the reason why this is the case, because the observations are generated from the robot which moves through the environment. If the robot could observe the whole scene, so it was just standing here, and can see the entire world because it has this magic great sensor, then this property wouldn't hold. But in most situations, we have a sensor which provides me local information. I observe the landmarks in my surrounding. This results in the fact that um, these, uh, we have larger values for these nearby features. 
And as I said, most of the off-diagonal elements are close to zero, but they are not zero. The question is actually, can we throw away a little bit of information from this information matrix so that it maintains sparse all the time and um, allows us to do efficient computations, but we still don't want to lose that much. So we want to have an approximation which is not too far away from the real estimate. It's kind of the challenge we pose it. So we can, if you say in a very, very rough ray, way, we could say, we could simply set most of these values to zero just by writing zero in this matrix. Um, so it turned out there are better ways for doing that than just setting those values to zero, and we'll come to that. And um, sparseness in this context here means that we have only a finite number of off-diagonal elements per node, and this doesn't increase if I roll the matrix. So let's say I've, I've, from one node, there's only a finite number of elements to other nodes, and this doesn't depend on the overall size of the matrix. So if the scene grows, the number of neighbors, so to say, that every node has should be should, should not grow. This is kind of the property of sparseness we use. The difference between like exactly sparse matrices and approximately sparse matrices. But if I talk about sparseness here, I talk about that we only have a finite number, every node has only a finite number of non-zero uh, off-diagonal elements. Um, and it doesn't depend on big the matrix is. So if I double the size of the environment, the number of neighbors should, should is that kind of clear what I mean with sparseness if I talk about sparseness? Yeah, yes, yes. The uh, covariance matrix in the common filter. Yeah. The value of this and the uh, uh, uncertainty different two landmarks is very small. If we do it inverse here it also in this format this is close to zero. I mean, when, so uh, because in the previous, uh, in the column of filter, we have every landmark are somehow related to each other, and mm -hmm. they have some correlation with uh, each other, and we have that value we stored in the, the Jacobian matrix, and then uh, it's uh, this forms or sigma, and when we do inverse on the sigma, as far as I know, we change it to the information matrix. So here in, the, in this matrix we should have very small value for them. So th it, it's true that the higher the the absolute values are in the covariance matrix, that means the larger the uncertainties we have. And the smaller the values are in this matrix here. So what is what was shown here was actually where the normalized matrices. So I take the smallest value, the biggest value, and scale them between zero and one. It's just to illustrate the pattern we have here. It's a kind of the grayness of this matrix can increase and decrease. It was kind of normalized out of these figures. This is, this is kind of completely true what you say here. So the hope is what we have is if we say we take our information matrix and take all the values which are really close to zero and just set them to zero. It's kind of just a small change in information. It can happen that actually the pattern we observe in the um, covariance matrix isn't that much different. Of course it will differ because it changed the value, but it's only slightly different. Um, but it, it, it nevertheless means that I can have a sparse or approximately sparse information matrix and still a fully dense covariance matrix. And if, I, if this is the case, operating on the information matrix is typically more efficient because I can represent that with less values. If I've, for example, basically the main diagonal and a few off diagonal elements, it's basically linear in the number of non uh, So, for example, multi matrix multiplication is uh, the complexity is. Uh, proportional to the number of, of non-zero elements I have. So it's, it's roughly linear in this case, which is a big, big advantage. And we, if we set to this small value to zero, we don't lose any information? We lose information. So we, we want to retrieve the previous. So whenever we set a value to zero, which is not zero in reality, we lose information. This is clearly the case. So I'm talking here about an approximate inference method, not an, not, not an exact one. So the results we are going to obtain if we use this Sparse extended information filter for solving the slam problem are worse from the estimation quality than the common filter or extended common filter. So we definitely lose something, but as it will turn out later on, this site filter is much more efficient. So we actually do most of the, com of the computations here in constant time compared to a quadratic complexity we have in EKF. And this is kind of the big win. And we can hope that we still have a big win in computation time. But the loss we have in precision is really, really small. There are parameters which we can control that, 
we'll illustrate that later on. Okay, so let's start with the concrete example of how the sparse extended information filter actually works. So um, let's look to the, what we can see here. We have seen we see here a four by four information matrix covering the rows, poles, just one block, and then uh, three. The, the other three dimensions um, are here the positions of the main marks. So in reality, this is a we have here two by two matrices and three by three matrices. But just think about this is blocks. So if we haven't observed anything, and we have just the robot with some uncertainty where it is. This is what the matrix looks like, the information matrix. We only have this element here, which, which has some value. And we don't know anything about those networks. So all these elements here are zero. Okay. So now we obtain the first observation. So we observe landmark number one. If we observe landmark number one, we actually here know something about this landmark one, and it depends on the estimate of x. So we kind of link the current pose and the observation. Look here. Okay. So if we have this off diagonal element here, it really corresponds to this link if we treat this these, these block here as a graph. Okay, now let's make a second observation. So we also observe landmark number two. This means from the robot's pose we learn something. So given the robot's pose, we learn something about the second position of the second landmark. So this is his landmark M2, this guy here. So we get a link between xt, the pose of the robot, and landmark number two. So this, uh, so this corresponds to this link over here. If we just sit here in one position we, and don't move, and we measure the first landmark and the second landmark, the landmarks itself are not correlated here. They're kind of correlated via the robot's pose. But there's no, at that moment, no direct uh, connection between those. Still clear? So that's all fine. So um, what happens if we, so the effect of these, the measurement update which I showed here, which is observing something in the uh, information filter is we just add information to this matrix. So we, we add new links, new elements in this matrix. Okay, so let's see what happens if we think about the motion update. So we're giving here in that, in that step exactly where we stopped the observations, and now we move a step forward. So the robot moves from xt to xt plus 1. What do you think will happen? New observation and perhaps... Sorry? The, there will be a new observation and uh, some correct more reduced, the maybe uncertainty about the position of landmark 1. So we are not talking about the observation yet, we are in the, in the motion step. So the observation step we already have, that means we are adding values to this information matrix. What about the motion update? If we, the robot just moves, so I did my observation, I observed the user landmark and someone else another landmark, and then I move a step forward without doing the next observation. What changes in the belief? The relation between the robot pose and the landmarks will decrease. Exactly. So the correlation between the robot's pose and the landmarks decrease. The reason for that is because I moved and I introduced an additional amount of uncertainty due to the motion. So given I know the pose of the robot now tells me less about the position of those landmarks because I moved in between. Okay. But given that I observed here two landmarks at the same time, then moved away, Given the robot's pose, I know less about those two. That's completely right what you said. But what if I know the position of one of those landmarks? What would it tell me about the other landmark? Given I'm standing here, observe Ramin, it's feature number one. Observe Olga, it's feature number two. So I, I observe you, and now I move somewhere else with increasing my uncertainty. So I'm less certain, let's say I have super huge uncertainty in my motion, so I kind of can be completely far off. What do I still know about you two guys? Same belief, because, the answer, because if you know the exact position of I Not the exact one, the approximate one. Perfect. Your relative position didn't change due to my movement. And some of the information which was which correlates you two guys, which
which was done due to my observation, while I'm moving and this information about the robots pose gets uncertain, this transferred can be seen as a transfer between a link between you two because I kind of have an estimate about your relative location. And this is exactly what happens in the motion update step of the information filter. So the robot moves from here to here. It gets the kind of the, the, the links between the robot's pose and the individual features are weakened. This is exactly what you said. And but as a result of that, at the same time, I gain some knowledge, as you correctly said, about um, the relative position of, of, of you two by kind of getting more uncertain about the robot's pose, you get correlated. Therefore, I get elements, non-zero elements, or elements are non-zero which have been zero before. And this was a step which kind of the, the motion step in the Excel information that kind of fills up my matrix. Okay, so that's the thing I have. So the effect of this update is that kind of by, by the fact that I move, I get more uncertain given the robot's pose about the correlation of the landmarks, but some of that knowledge is kind of transferred to a link between those landmarks. You can see this or illustrate that just as a sketchy uh, illustration is shifting uncertainty uh, information from these elements to this element. Because these two elements are weaker now, and this element gets stronger now. Okay. So it's still the fact that the robot's pose is more uncertain after the motion. So it's not that all the information we have is preserved. I add uncertainty if I move, but some of the information is moved to this new field which cor correlates the two landmarks with each other. Okay, so the effect of the motion update is, is weakens the correlations between uh, the robot's pose and the landmarks, and it adds correlations between those landmarks. This effects in adding up values in this matrix. Right? If we do that, we continue like this, we have a full dense information matrix. Everything gets correlated. It's basically everything. Dense matrix are really bad for operations like inversion and things like this. So we, our goal is to get rid of that. And now let's say, let's introduce an approximation now and el eliminate some of the information which is in here. And the goal is to do just a minimal elim elimination of information. So we don't lose much, but this matrix gets sparse. This kind of all go. And therefore, the sparse extended information filter at the third step, adds a third step after the um, motion and the measurement. Step, which is the sparsification. And the goal is to sparsify this matrix, to kind of remove information from this matrix so that we don't lose too much of the information, but still we get some zero elements in this matrix. Okay, so let's say what we do in here is um, we take one of those edges, so this edge over here corresponds to this element, so these two elements actually, but they're the same because it's symmetric. And what's the sparsification set? I simply throw away some of these correlations. So eliminate these guys. Just throw them away. So it kind of leads to the removal of this edge, which you can illustrate here by setting these values here to zero. Just I throw away information from my matrix. However, this is not what we do in reality. It's not we are just setting those values to zero and keep the rest of the matrix the same. We can do that in a smarter way, but that way, let's say we transfer some of this information which is in here into the links between the two poses and the, uh, the landmarks and landmark two in the robot. Because we had an edge in here, if we remove that edge, we can at least transfer some of the information in these links and make these links stronger. So with a few elements which get higher values, but others we can set to zero. And in all the mathematical operations we do in the matrix, we are only interested in kind of reducing the number of non-zero elements, so having elements that are zero. And therefore, this operation is fine. So, of course, again, we lose some information. So this this specification is not an exact operation. These two, these two beliefs, so this one and this one, they are not equal. But, as I said, I want to I'm happy to lose some information if my matrix gets sparse. So kind of this is the idea of this sparsification step. So sparsification means ignoring correlations between random variables. So we lose some information. And what we are doing here is 
removing the correlations between the robots posed and some landmarks. We keep the correlation with some landmarks, and with some landmarks we want to remove them. And in order to do that, to decide which one we eliminate, which one we keep, the sports extended information filter introduces the concept of so-called active and passive landmarks. Active landmarks are those which are updated in the, in the appropriate way. That means um, if you want to move from the sparse extended information filter to the information filter, we just say all landmarks are active landmarks. But the sparse extended information filter says, hmm, let's take limit number of active landmarks, let's say to 10. I just want to maintain 10 landmarks appropriately. That means by moving, I add correlations between those 10 landmarks. But I also have passive landmarks, and I don't want to update those passive landmarks. And then, um, and then, then continue with the operations. And um, what happened in the specification step is a landmark which was passive before, it was active before, and is disabled, is passive. The, the correlations between the robot pose and this landmark that becomes passive is removed. So we have a small set of landmarks, which we call the active ones, for which we maintain all the correlations between the robots pose and the landmarks. But as soon as we kind of take a new landmark in as an active one, we have to throw out another one, and then we remo remove the, the direct correlations between this landmark and the robots pose. And if you say we keep the number of active landmarks small and constant, this allows us in the end, and we'll go to the details why that's the case, to a constant time algorithm approximately constant time algorithm. Okay, so um, the active landmarks is a subset of all landmarks, and these are typically the landmarks in the close vicinity of the robot. It typically includes all the landmarks that are currently observed. So every landmark I observe is in this active set. And the passive landmarks are all other landmarks. Okay, let's go to this um, um, specification step where we said we take the, some of the information which is stored in this, um, in this blocks here and move it to these other elements. So kind of removing one link and making the other links a little bit stronger. This, so this means that matrix M1, so this one here, was an active landmark because we had that correlations and turns now to a passive one. And <coughs> specification kind of rips out the um, information between the robot that correlates the robot's pose and this landmark M1. Therefore, this is what we call it was active, but it's now a passive one. M2 is an active landmark. We have the correlations between the robot's pose and the landmark. And M3 is in this case a passive landmark. In this specific example, it has never been observed, but it can also be a landmark um, which, let's say, M0 would be visited before. Note that there still can be links between landmarks. The specification step does not remove links between two landmarks. It only removes the links between the robot's pose and the landmarks that get passive. So we still maintain links between features, but if we do all the things in the right way, this number is limited in the end, because it only kind of corresponds to the local neighborhood of those landmarks. This means that every landmark has just a limited number of connections to other landmarks. Who has not understand kind of the basic idea of the sparse extent information? This kind of kind of I don't I don't understand why it's better to spread the numbers yeah. instead of just setting it to zero. Okay, so um, so the question is, if I have my dense matrix, why is it better to take some information out and move it somewhere else? And then setting the value to zero, or setting it exact directly to zero, just overriding those values. This was the question, right? Yeah. Okay. So if I do that, I just override these value, the value, and set it to zero. I directly it corresponds to removing an edge from my graph, and that's it. I just remove one edge. It clearly leads to a sparser matrix. I completely agree with you. However, if we say um, we kind of, okay, let's consider a simple example. So we have three nodes. 
Well, let's take an example which is not slime, which comes from the physical world, so it's maybe easier to grasp it. So these are masses, let's say one kilogram blocks. And between those masses, we have springs. This is a problem which can be modeled to take it more or less the same one. So what you would do if you would say, I just set a value to zero, it was just, I rip out one of those springs. Right? That's what you would do. So if you measure the information you have between those nodes, you can see that as how stiff this, these masses are. Um, so one option is to kind of eliminate the spring and have only exactly the same springs I had before in here. It's one way for doing this. The problem is this network here of masses and springs is less stiff than this one, right? Because I removed the spring. So option two, you can see I also remove this spring between those two nodes, but here I add stronger springs, which are stronger than this one. And then this group of nodes is kind of stiffer, or it's between the stiffness of these two, these two, these two um, configurations. I understand that, but this information isn't really useful, right? This, this information is not really the correlation between two. So the thing is, I it's can't. Not equal to the no, it's, it's not equal. So these solutions are not equal. But we, if we say, if you see the information is kind of how stiff the network is. So you have here a stiffness, whatever. I don't know how stiffness is actually measured, but let's say a stiffness of one, and this is a stiffness of 0.5. This thing has a stiffness between 1 and 0.5. So we are closer to the original thing what we want to approximate. So let's say we have this configuration and I tell you, now you have to build the thing with only two springs, but you're allowed to replace your springs. You can either say, I don't replace my straight, the spring, the springs, I just take one out. If another person says, I simply take out all the springs and, and buy simply sell my three springs and buy two springs which are stronger than the other ones, I'm closer to this configuration in terms of stiffness than this configuration. It simply means you can do that. So it's completely legal to say, I do the approximation, I set those values to zero. The thing is what you can show is that this is a, you make a bigger approximation error if you do that compared to the fact when you buy these better or stiffer springs. So you can still do that. You can set those values to zero and say, this is my approximation. It's completely valid as an approximation. The thing is, this approximation introduces a bigger error than uh, the one way we replace them by, by, by stronger springs. Is this, does this kind of answer your question? Sure. Okay. Perfect. Are there further questions before we continue? Okay. So, in the support system information filter, like the key trick is actually to do this sparsification and to have this set of active and passive landmarks. Kind of the two key ingredients of the sparse extended information filter. And the sparse extended information filter does this sparsification after each iteration. So after each motion and measurement update, it performs this sparsification step. And as a, an effect of that is that the robot's pose is only correlated to a small set of landmarks, exactly the active ones because all the other correlations we removed. The springs we have, we have taken away and replaced where we replaced the others. So the robot's pulse is only correlated or directly correlated with these um, active landmarks. Again, this is an approximation, an effect of its sparsification. Um, and the other thing is that landmarks only have, land, have um, direct links with other landmarks that are close. You can see this. These are those landmarks which have been active together. Because once they were active together, the motion update kind of filled their off-diagonal elements. A set of landmarks which are active together and then do the motion update, I introduce um, correlations between them. Just kind of strengthen those links between them. Like strengthen the relative knowledge between uh, I mean, and Olga. 
So only if you two have been at one point in time active in the same set, so you both were in the, at the same time in the set of active features, there's a possibility that you have a connection between, direct connection between you. If this wouldn't be the case, there would be no connection between you. So this explains intuitively the second effect in here that every network is only directly connected to a constant or a small number of other landmarks. And these are those which are nearby because the nearby landmarks are those which have been seen at the same time and have been in the active set at the same time. And these are the two important things because this means that our matrix is actually sparse or stays sparse even if we process revisit places over and over again. So that every landmark has only a very limited number of direct connections to other landmarks, and the robot's pose is only directly connected to the act currently active landmarks. That means that some we have a matrix where no matter how big the environment is, so if I kind of duplicate the environment, we will have the same roughly the same number of direct connections of non-zero elements in the matrix for every line. Right? Is it kind of clear? So has everyone understood why, if you do the after the sparsification step, even if you do it multiple times after, so if you do it every iteration, so over and over again, that this matrix stays sparse. This little explanation of why this is the case. Okay. Okay. So let's dive into the details of the sparse extended information filter. As I told you before, there are three key steps. So there's the motion update, there's the measurement update, and there's a the sparsification step. Okay, this wasn't really the truth. Because in reality, we have four steps. And there's a step between the motion update and the measurement update, and this is the update of the state estimate of the mean. Because as you may remember, the information filter, or the external information filter, had one of the problems. It actually needed the mean estimate to compute the transformation of of the robot. So kind of for the motion update, we need to have an estimate where the robot currently is. And the same well, it's actually also for the measurement update. If we want to do the measurement update, we need to know where the robot is because uh, we need to compute the expected observation of the landmark. So we need to know the estimate of the mean and the estimate where that specific landmark that I'm observing is in the environment. Otherwise, I cannot compute the expected measurement. So not, for example, the range bearing um, I'm expecting to get given my current knowledge. So therefore, I need the mean in order to do the computations. The extend, extended information filter, this was really done by explicitly computing the mean from the information vector and the um, information matrix. But this is a costly operation. So what the site does, it does some really, really dirty tricks in two to get an approximation, not an, an estimate, of the mean, at least for a subset of the mean that I currently need. I currently need. And um, this is something we just need. So after this operation, we can actually exploit the mean to, to do the, the steps. This is not done in exact way. This is done in an approximation. At the end of the course so today or, or next week, I will quickly go to that how this is done. But for the moment, for, at least for the next hour, assume we can actually, at least in an approximate way, compute the mean, given that we have the so an estimate of the mean before and the information matrix from the information vector. So is it clear to everyone why the mean is needed? This is central, or somewhat central for the understanding of the algorithm. So I need the mean in the motion update because I have a motion update equation. They don't work on the information vector. They only work, operate on the mean vector. So kind of on the physical position I have. But if I have a position here when x, y, theta at a certain location and I carry out a motion command, I need to compute, given I was here, I go uh, I'm here. Therefore, I need the mean. Therefore, it's needed in the motion step. And it's needed in the measurement step because if I say, given my, let's say I have my estimate in the information vector and information matrix form. But I now want to predict what's the, diff what's the distance between the current pose of the robot and whatever I mean that's sitting there. I can't directly compute that or easily compute that from the information vector information matrix. I need to recover the mean where as a robot and where as a landmark you know, to compute what do I expect given my belief. And for the sparsification 
I need the mean as well, so we'll see later on. But that's the reason why I need an estimate of the mean. And this is why we have the same step. So you look at it here, and if you would have a question. We, we, we pass it to the G function in the EIF also. Yeah, not in the EIF, yes. But the EIF, we explicitly computed the mean from the information matrix and the information vector, which requires an inversion of the big, huge matrix. And this is too costly. It's the inversion is kind of all of n to the power of 2.4 approximately. So this is a super costly operation we want to avoid because if we have to do this, converse, uh, this conversion, we can perfectly keep the Kalman filter because then there would be no, no win above the Kalman filter. Here we have G function as well. We have the G function as well. Computing the G function is not the issue, but computing the input for the G function. So the mean, the mean estimate. And I want to approximate that. Okay. So this leads me to the four key steps of the sparse extended information filter for SLAM in written in algorithmic form. The first thing we do, so we do the motion update, give we have the information vector, the information matrix, the last mean estimate, and the motion. This gives me a predicted uh, information vector, a predicted information matrix, and a predicted mean. Okay. Then I kind of do some dirty trick to improve the mean. Some updates to that. Come to that later. And then I do the measurement update. Because for the measurement update, I need the mean here as an input in order to know where the landmarks are and where the robot is to compute this expected landmark estimation. And then, in the last step, I do the sparsification step. So the difference between the extended information filter and the sparse extended information filter is that we have here now three variables, information vector, information matrix, and the mean. So we need to maintain the three quantities. And these are the individual steps, and my goal is to go through these individual steps and explain you these steps. The motion update, the measurement update, we will do in significant detail. The specification, I will give you the, the, the idea how this works and which correlations we neglect and which impact this has. And I don't want to derive all the formulas for good reason. Because it's much easier to do than a piece of paper um, than here on the blackboard. Um, but I will guide you to the key steps which are done so you can understand that if you look into the book. And then there is the state estimation update, which I just will briefly touch, because it's something which is um, a little bit away, or a little bit further away from this kind of all common filter framework. And it's in the end done with an error minimization technique. You just say, you can see that the gradient descent, so you kind of locally optimize where it is. Um, we'll go to this kind of error, optimize, error minimization techniques later on in the course. So false to Christmas being slam is error minimization. Then you will perfectly understand that. But for the moment, it's not really relevant to understand the site. It just means we have an approximation to, to, to update the mean. Okay, so let's start. Let's start with the motion update. In the um, motion update, um, well, this is the expensive or the easy thing in the information filter, instead of information filter, the expensive one. So we'll get a little bit involved in here now. Whenever you need a break, say, hey, why is this operation done in this way? Let me know. I will stop, go back, and revisit all that. Okay. Before I start with the motion update, just need to introduce you to one rule. Some of you may know that from linear algebra, it's the matrix and virtual lemma. And it simply states that Given we have two matrices, the matrix R and the matrix Q, they are invertible quadratic matrices. And if any other kind of matrix um, P, then inverting this quantity results in this long formula over here. And already write this, this is just a tool we will use later on in this motion update step in the matrix inversion. Exploit that. Also sometimes called the um, Sherman Morrison formula. So I'm not this thing. Generally the matrix So you can prove that on how the page of take off 
on how to page of equations. I decided to skip that because we just exploit that. In the end, we will be at some point where we have exactly this formula and just replace it by this tool. Just to let you know where this comes from, this is a matrix inversion network. Need more information about that, or you want to learn more about it, why this is the case, let me know. I have to explain it to you. But I decided to not put that here in the course because it doesn't really add a lot of value in understanding this parse extended information. Okay, so let's go to the prediction step. What we want to do is we want to compute the predicted information vector, the predicted information matrix, and the predicted mean, given the previous estimate we had and the motion command u. This is kind of the goal we have. And the thing is, we want to be able to exploit the fact that um, the information matrix is a sparse matrix. Because we start with a sparse matrix, and we do the sparsification step at every point in time after our operation. So at every point in time when we execute that function, we actually have a sparse information matrix. So we can exploit the fact that it is sparse. So then we have two quantities, two ingredients. This is what we want to compute, and we want to do that efficiently and exploiting the fact that it is a sparse information matrix. So this what you see here is an EKF slam. So this is something you should know. The first part of the, or well actually it is the um, prediction step of the EKF slam. So I have this matrix here, which kind of takes the three by three um, Jacobian for the motion update and transforms it to this five dimensional space, this fx. Um, so we can update the mean, the predicted mean, the old mean plus this matrix blows up the three-dimensional state to this high-dimensional state, and this comes from the motion update equation. The state x, y, theta is updated according to motion command. So this was the update of the mean, step number three. Four and five is the update of the um, variance matrix. So we first have to compute the Jacobian, which is the identity matrix, plus this kind of element in this three by three block corresponding to the robot's pose. So it's the it was the identity for all the landmark part of the state vector, and um, did the update in the three by three block, which represent the robot's motion. And then the standard update formula for the variance. For the so this is just copy paste from the EKF slam chapter. You look as if you don't believe me, so which one is So this is exactly it's copy paste operation from the uh, from the other chapter. Okay, so let's do copy paste, copy paste, copy paste. Take these three blocks, the first three lines, so line two, three, and four, and copy it over to our um, um, side motion update. So these kind of things we can directly use. And there's a fourth thing, which is the update of the covariance matrix, and we can actually. We use this as a building block, so we know that this is the covariance matrix, so if we invert this, we obtain the information matrix, right? So we use this later on as a building block uh, to compute the information matrix. Okay, let's start. Write down our algorithm side mo motion update. So we again define this function f of x, uh, this, this matrix. Here we have this kind of delta vector just because it's easier to write later on, which corresponds to this motion update equation. Exactly the same one we had before for DK. And we compute the delta vector, which is the, the block of the, um, the, the, the three by three block I add to the identity matrix from EG. So basically copy and paste operations. Okay, so the next thing we need to do, we need to compute the last line here, the update of the information matrix. Okay, all this is done. I said the information matrix is the inverse of the covariance matrix. Okay, so I can put in the formula which I had in here for the um, from, from the EKF and just put that into the covariance matrix. So I end up with this term. Is it clear how we reach that point? So this one, this is corresponds to the um, covariance matrix at t minus one, so it's the information matrix inverted. 
G and D transpose stay exactly the same. And here we have the term that's called RT instead of FX, RT only responsible for the 3 by 3 component X and the other uh, F plus F on the other side. Okay. So now what we can do is we can actually define a variable, fine, and then say um, this equals to this part over here, inverted. Just a definition we do. This term over here can be rewritten. So if you invert a matrix, if you have multiple matrix in an inversion, so in, in, in brackets, you can move the inverse to the inside and swap the order of the elements. So this term gets inverted across the first position. This term gets inverted, so it's the information matrix inverted and again inverted. So it stays the information matrix. And this term over here inverted goes away. So no black magic. Okay, this means we can actually rewrite re re our information matrix system over here by this equation. better to not use RT here, but to use my matrix matrices which map between this 3 by 3 space and this high dimensional space and write this in this form. So just the exact replacement of what was written before. So this was the, the noise matrix only for x, y, theta. The curse is just a 3 by 3 matrix about the motion update. and just expanded it to the high dimensional space. Okay. This guy now has a form, a form that we can actually execute or use it, the matrix inversion back. So next step, takes this function, so we had before um, the matrix R, P, and Q in the equation. So you have to make a replacement of P, R, and Q, this matrix, and then we come up with the result of the matrix inversion back. Just, just what's written here. So it's just only applying uh, the matrix inversion back. No, Nothing special. Okay. Now let's look to this block over here. The first term over here is our 3 by 3 matrix inverted. Inverting a 3 by 3 matrix doesn't invert at all. And this thing here is also a 3 by 3 matrix. And this guy we invert again. So this is just an inversion of a 3 by 3 matrix. There's nothing which is costly. Okay. So this thing can be computed efficiently. Okay. So we have these two f, fxt and f, fx. This one is this huge matrix which just had a 3 by 3 block which is non zero, which was the identity, and the rest of this matrix were all the euros. We have the 3 by 3 matrix, we multiply it with, with our matrix, which blows it up into a high dimensional space. In the end is just a 3 by 3 block, the rest is all zero. And now we have this matrix. Um, we have this matrix over here. So we block from here to here. You just see high dimensional matrix, but it's only a, a small 3 by 3 block, block which is non zero and the rest is all zero. And we multiply that by another matrix. So, this operation, the old operation here, is a, is a constant time operation if this matrix phi, this uh, here, phi t is sparse. Because if this is sparse, if a matrix which has just very a constant number of elements in, in each line and row, so multiply with a matrix that has just a 3 by 3 block and zero everywhere else, but just manipulate a small part of that matrix. So it's like... It means you have this kind of huge matrix, 
Um, and this is just a few elements, so that you made diagonal, and you have a few elements which are non zero, or the rest is all zero. And then you subtract it from again the same matrix. And then having another matrix with one with an interesting property. We have a 3 by 3 block, which is non zero, and all the rest is zero. And then the matrix here multiplied again. So at the end, if you take the product of the three matrices, this is again a huge high dimensional matrix, but only a small block actually has values which are different from zero. And these values, you take our original matrix and subtract them from this matrix because we had just a subtraction over there. So if this matrix is sparse, I can do that efficiently. If it's not sparse, so if this matrix here is densely populated, this three by three block may involve the whole row or a whole, whole column in the multiplication operation. And then it's not sparse anymore, it would be at least linear in the dimension of it. But if it's just a constant number, independently of the size of the matrix, that's just a constant number of non-zero elements, then it can be done in constant time. So this update is constant time if this matrix um, phi is um, sparse. Kind of clear. Who needs further explanation for that? I think it's a good moment to make a five minute break, open the windows, and then we restart <laughs> fresh from scratch. <laughs> Inside, the key insight you should have received, or you should have got from this last slide is that we can express the information, the predicted information matrix, so these two terms. If I use the matrix inversion lemma, I can transform that into a, this special form. And the most important thing was the thing here, the 3 by 3 matrix, out there is a matrix which is just the 3 by 3 block, which is non zero, which is actually the identity matrix. And the rest is all zero, so it maps it up to the high dimensional space. And it's multiplied by a uh, sparse matrix. And then subtracted from this sparse matrix. That means this block over here only touches a constant number of elements. That means if I implement that, I only need to, to subtract a constant number of elements from this matrix. This is kind of the the key essence here. So if this is really a sparse matrix, we can compute that efficiently, then this step is a constant time operation. Right? Okay. So to simplify all the expressions, you just replace this term by, by this kappa t. And the question is, can we actually compute this term, so this variable here, in an efficient way? Uh, this variable here in an efficient now it's not the inverse anymore, but it was up here. It's the non-inverse one. Oh, fine. Can we do this computation effective efficiently? It's kind of next step. We try to compute this term with this guy over here. We now want to compute efficiently. So the next step we do now. Okay. So the goal is, just to remind you of that. Constant time operation. So if this guy here, it's the previous information matrix, was sparse, we want to do all these operations in constant time and come up with this uh, variable. Five. Okay. Good old goal. Okay. So let's have a look to G because we need G in order to do the computations over here. So G appears here twice, transposed and then inverted, um, and just do this for G. T um, inverted can do exactly the same for the transposed inverted matrix, exactly the same derivation. Okay, the first thing we can do is we can replace G by its definition. So what's the identity matrix plus an, a matrix delta which is 
non-zero and this is three by three non-zero matrix, which is added to the first three components, which gives up the, um, the Jacobian. So we have the identity plus the matrix, which maps this three by three matrix into this high dimensional space where only the first three by three block is non-zero. So this is added up, so this is what the definition of the Jacobian. S done in the K is fine. Should we go back and show that, or you still remember that? So, Jacobian G had the form was always one on the diagonal. Was zero here, zero over here, and here it has two non-zero elements. So this one and this one. This was zero. This was zero. This was zero. This was zero. So this this block over here. Or what we call GTX. And I can express this, this whole G, by the identity matrix, the whole identity matrix, plus these two guys put in a matrix which is everywhere zero except in these positions, it is non zero. This corresponds to exactly this. Fx transpose this delta. So this the delta matrix is one second. This delta matrix was the matrix which was zero, zero, non-zero, zero, zero, non-zero, zero, zero, zero. And this was a term kind of which comes from the non-linearity if I derive the motion equation with sine and cosine. Okay? Next thing I do can do, I can just add zero to this term again. Just say this minus fx transpose i fx plus fx transpose i. Fx. I guess everyone agrees with that, right? Okay. So let's look what happens the next step. I can go here and move fxt and ft out of the sum, and then inside the, I have this um, bracket over here with i plus delta. So these two matrix added up, and these two are the output matrices. Okay. And here nothing changed. Okay, so next thing I can do, next line. If you look to these, Matrices uh, oh wait. Uh, in here. The oval inverse moves to the inside. Delta. 
right? The three by three. Three by three matrix. So this is also an identity which is a three by three identity. So it's a three by three matrix which I need to invert, which is a piece of cake, and I subtract the identity from that. Also nothing, which is computational trick. So this is a three by three matrix. That's great. It's a three by three matrix. So we can officially compute the inverse of the Jacobian. What I compute here, the Jacobian I could easily compute, this was known already, but now I even efficiently computed the inverse of the Jacobian, which I need for this computation over here. It can do exactly the same with the transposed uh, version of that. So I can simply replace this term by psi and say this is an identity matrix. Um, so this is a two n the three plus two n dimensional matrix and identity matrix. And I have the psi. This, this term here can be computed efficiently. So, just an explanation for that. This is zero. This matrix is a high dimensional matrix except of a three by three block. And um, it's added to the identity matrix. So the inverse, GT inverse is an identity except of a three by three block. Jacobian is an identity matrix plus the three by three block, which is something else. Okay. And the same holds for the for the transposed inverse. So the inverse of Jacobian and the inverse of the transposed Jacobian are just identity matrices with the three by Three block, which is not an identity matrix. That's good. And the other thing that the information matrix we had in the previous times, they were sparse. Because we started with a sparse matrix, we use a sparsification step at every point in time, so that the information matrix is sparse at every point in time. So this is an identity, except for the three by three block. This is a sparse matrix, and the same here. That means this thing here can also be computed. Because I just need to do this three, these operation of this three by three matrix on a constant number of elements because this thing is sparse. So the three by three matrix with a constant number of multiplications get a constant time operation. So this can be done in constant time. It's perfect. Okay. So it's just another explanation I have why this is a constant time operation. <coughs> if you don't believe it, believe me how I explain it in that roughly way. It's identity something, some small block, sparse matrix, and, this, and the same identity with a small block. This explanation can in detail go through it why this is the case. So this, this guy was sparse, this was our assumption. So I can replace this one by the identity plus the um, matrix psi, just post. Use the same the other way around. They can multiply it out. So the information matrix here. And then I have this huge term. And um, this term here can be seen, this is, an, is a matrix, which has zero elements everywhere except of a constant number of entities. Because what we're doing here is we just hit this identity matrix with a small subplot, block, and we multiply it by this individual sparse matrix. So I kind of broke that up, just kind of explanation ahead with these three matrices just the two matrices. We have this identity with a small block and multiplied with one single sparse matrix. So the three by three block is just multiplied with a constant number of elements in this information matrix. Because for all the rest, it's zero. You multiply three by three block with all these zero elements, you don't need to compute it because you know it's zero. You only need to look up those matrices, those elements in the matrix which are non-zero, and do the uh, corresponding operations. Of course, all these things require that if you implement that, that you have a kind of a matrix library which supports explicitly sparse matrices. That means it doesn't allocate all the memory and fills everything with zero. Those, those techniques use a more efficient technique, like for example, a hash table, where it only stores the elements which are non-zero. And then you can directly address those non-zero elements and you don't need to check every one. Is it zero, is it zero, is it zero? It just says, give me all the non-zero elements in that row, in that for example. The, the, the table gets ready for that. So you need to have a good library 
if you implement that so that it's really that you can do these operations in a constant amount of time. Otherwise, if your computer doesn't know if the matrix stores zeros or ones, then in which position it has to do all the multiplication to zero. But um, a good matrix library does it. Okay, we are all, almost there. So just to summarize what we did, we first computed the psi, which resulted from the inverse of the Jacobian. Kind of non small, this kind of small three by three block blown up to the higher space. If you have that, you can complete this, this matrix <coughs> lambda. Again, constant time. If you have lambda, you can compute phi. If you have phi, you can compute kappa. And if you have kappa, you can compute our information matrix. These are kind of the steps we did so far. The reason why they are a little bit kind of one big book. You do that this way, it's kind of easier because you have the correspondences to the individual terms. You can actually use this, so directly now write down the cipher. So, we use four lines of the stuff we did before. The first step which was certain, the kind of copy paste from the counter filter. And then we compute um, psi, we compute lambda, we compute phi, we compute kappa. Just by using exactly the terms we used before, and all of these operations are constant, uh, are constant time operations, given that the information matrix is sparse. If it wouldn't be sparse, it wouldn't be constant time operations. Given that they are sparse, it is. You okay, know, we did all the important steps, and we were able to compute the information matrix. The only thing which needs to be done is the information vector and the mean. And that's pretty straightforward. So the mean is easily updated, just doing again a copy-paste operation from our common filter. So the predicted mean was the old mean times the delta. And this is just kind of the nonlinear function g and the three by three block blown up to the side dimensional space. So here was my fx and here was my delta vector. This so was just the application. Okay, this was easy. Now we also have to do that with the information vector. The information vector is um, the so what what written here is comes from the formula where you say the information vector is the information matrix times the mean. And what's written here is this is the old mean, the last time step. These elements here. And this was the update of the mean. So if we'll go back one slide, it's exactly this equation. Where mu t minus one is the previous information matrix times the previous information vector. The inverse of the information matrix. So this one. So this these two the inverse of the information matrix times the information vector gives you the mean. And then it's just this is just the new mean. It's clear for everyone the first line over here. So we had the new mean is or the mean the mean we had before plus our fx transpose. So you all agreed on that, right? What else do we have? Psi equals to the um, information matrix times the mean. Right. So we can write that as predicted, of course times, just extend, put this one in here, so this is the old mean, plus FAC delta x. And now, we can use this to replace that back in the information form. And this leads us 
exactly to this equation over here. So this all the information vector for the previous type step, T minus 1, and with the information vector of T minus 1 plus Fxt delta T. So this is what we have here. We can just multiply it out. So this is the information matrix times the first term of the information matrix. Common game, and then 
um, computing the covariance matrix and computing the, the mean. Right? This is the only thing that is just a little bit different. So I still have the Jacobian of the measurement function that is still exactly the same as in the extended common filter. And then the only difference is the update of the information vector and the update of the information matrix is done exactly as in the extended information filter. Because this was just adding up, the measurement was just adding up the new information we have in the information matrix. If you remember the introduction slide, we are just adding values to this matrix. And exactly the same happens here. I just add the corresponding values to my information matrix. This was a super easy, trivial step in the um, uh, extended information filter. This is just the direct application of it. So everything is exactly the same as an EKF slam, except these two lines, which are the lines which we need to compute according to the ex extended information filter, because we are an information filter framework. But kind of the whole thing with computing the expected measurements, initializing the landmarks, it's exactly the one-to-one -one equivalent thing as in the extended common filter. OK, perfect. We did the motion update. We did the measurement update. The two key steps which we used are already done. And again, it's a little bit involved. I would like to finish for now, give you time to relax, to revisit that. And next Monday, when we continue with the lecture, I will continue here with the specification step and the update step, uh, how to update the mean. Please quickly sketch what's going on in there um, so that you get a complete picture of when with the sports extended information filter. And then, um, kind of finish that and move to a new topic, namely to the particle filter driven approaches. Give also a short wrap up on what we have learned, a kind of comparison between the extended common filter, the UKF, the extended information filter into SIFE, which is kind of a family or the small family. They actually multiple variants of this as well, like the unscented information filter and whatever. But we say these are the kind of the key elements you should know. And um, we kind of compare them a little bit, at least in an informal way. What are the advantages? What are these advantages? Disadvantages of the individual um, techniques in this context. And then we'll actually move on to the particle filter driven approaches. So it's a different approach to address the swine problem, which doesn't rely on a parametric representation of the Gaussian distribution, as this is just here. And a lot of new and interesting things will come up. We'll come up there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.